Hello, we're here with uh, Supreme Court uh, Judge Helen Whitner, Whitner, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, and we are here uh, to uh, go ahead and uh, if you would like to give a two minute interview, or sorry, a two minute introduction, we'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm newly appointed Justice G. Helen Whitner to the Washington State Supreme Court. Prior to this appointment, which actually was just a few weeks ago, on the 13th, I was a Pierce County Superior Court judge for about five years. Prior to that, I was a Board of Industrial Insurance Appeals judge for over two years. And I've been a pro tem judge in district court, Pierce County District Court, as well as the City of Tacoma Municipal Court for over seven years. I'm also a former prosecutor as well as public defender and defense attorney. So I've done pretty much everything. I'm originally from the island of Trinidad and Tobago, and I was Pierce County's first immigrant born judge. I am also the state's first black Supreme Court, black female Supreme Court justice, and I'm also the first black female LGBT justice in the state of Washington. And I was the first black LGBT judge in the state of Washington, and I believe I still am. I have worked in a number of areas, as you've known, but my extrajudicial activities is very stringent. I belong to a number of organizations where I'm very actively involved. The International Association of Women Judges, the National Association of Women Judges, I'm on the Advisory Council 30 seconds. for QLaw, and I speak often on human rights and access to justice to our courts. I've implemented a number of programs, one that is well known as the Color of Justice Program, which brought young females into the court and brought judges from marginalized Ten backgrounds seconds. to assist them and encourage and inspire them to the legal profession. Thank you. Uh, so now we'll be moving on into the uh, four prepared questions and uh, we'll go in the order of Jeff, Alice, um, Jason, then uh, Clayton. And I've posted those into the chat box. And the responses to these are two minutes apiece. Um, Great. Um, so question one, in the 1930s, a right wing court invalidated a voter approved measure to create a graduated income tax in Washington state on a narrow five to four vote. Earlier this year, the Supreme Court refused to rule on whether that precedent remained valid. Do you believe that case, Culleton v. Chase, was correctly decided? Would you be willing to overturn it? Well, Supreme Court justices and most judges actually cannot give an answer to that question as it is posed. We are prohibited from giving our opinions on cases that come before us, and especially in light of the Supreme Court position, I definitely cannot answer that question the way it is posed. Needless to say, I'm bound to follow the rules of law. I've always done that, and I listen to both sides that bring their arguments to the court, and I try to make a well-reasoned decision based on the information I receive and my interpretation of the law. Okay, thank you. Uh, question two, Alice. Yeah, um, question two, do you support the death penalty? Similar question as to the first one. As a Supreme Court justice, I cannot answer that question as it is posed. I do believe, however, everyone is entitled to fear representation. And as again, a judicial officer, my role is to be impartial in the application of the law. I do not make law, I interpret law and I apply law to the facts that are brought before the court. So whether or not I support or don't support the death penalty, I'm prohibited from answering that question as it is posed. Great, thank you. Uh, question number three. Um, I believe I said that might be Jason. Yes. Um, <clears throat> should Washington State continue to elect uh, Supreme Court just, justices in contested elections, or should we use some other model? Second part. 
are you concerned that having to face challengers in an elected uh, in an election would shape the way the court decides its cases? All right. That one, as it's written, I can't answer, but here's how I am going to answer it. When I got to the Pierce County Superior Court, there was concern because of my race, because of my gender, because of my sexual orientation, because of the marginalized labels used to identify me, that somehow I would be favorable to any subset that I belong to. What people found out is I apply the law to the facts that are brought to me. And I've had to make some unfavorable decisions to different facets of who I am. What you do get with me is a judge that will listen clearly. I bring my marginalized lens to the analysis, something that the bench in this state has been missing. And I make the best decision I can. I've walked in many shoes and I've had, and I've had to go without. So my lens is different. My voice is different. My application of the law is probably going to be a little more different than most, but I will try to apply the law in a fair manner, irrespective of who brings it. In regards to our courts, the problem I see with our courts is a lack of diversity, not just in race, gender, sexual orientation, or those labels, but a lack of diversity in experience as well. We need to represent the people that we serve. Great, thank you. Um, and now we are in question four. Clayton, are you able to ask that one? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Judge Whitener. Um, which U.S. Supreme Court justice, past or present, do you consider as a model for how to be an effective and just member of the highest court? That one's tough because I like two of them. One is Justice Thurgood Marshall. And what I loved about him is he brought a different perspective to the bench when he joined the bench, and that was an equality lens. Yeah. And it was from his experience as a litigator that he was able to convince his colleagues to certain decisions that ended up being very, very powerful decisions that actually, I think, allowed me to be sitting here today. The other one is Justice Ginsburg. I think she is just fire. She's a trailblazer. She speaks her mind. She stands for her conviction. She is well-reasoned when she does make a decision. And I basically aspire to be somewhat like her and bring the lens of Justice Thurgood Marshall to the bench. Mm -hmm. But those would be the two. Terrific. Thank you. Great. Um, so now we're going to move into follow-up questions. And the responses to these are one minute apiece. Okay. Um, would anybody like to ask a follow-up question? Um, if so, you can raise your hand or post it into the chat box. Um, or Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you're on mute. Ding. Unmuted. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> there you go. So, Judge Whitener, I am wondering if you are able to comment on whether you believe that um, systemic racism, misogyny, and ec the resulting economic disparities help to shape the types of cases that go through the court system currently and whether you feel that there is a mechanism by which a Supreme Court justice is able to perhaps help reshape that. What do you see would be the difference in a court if we in fact had economic and social justice? I think you would have an, a court that is representative of all of the people that it serves. If you, there are certain things I can't speak on now, but what I realize I can say to individuals is I have a track record. I've been very transparent since getting to this bench. 
So I'm also a co-chair of the, minor the state's Minority and Justice Commission. I am also on the Oversight Committee for the Office of Civil Legal Aid. So I have covered both spectrums in trying to address inequities in our judiciary and treating them in regard treating the issues of the people. Thank you very, very much. Thanks. Any further questions? You can raise your hand using the button or um, message me. Uh, Jason and then Jeff. Yes, uh, Judge Whitener. Um, what's your judicial philosophy? My judicial philosophy is, first of, and foremost, you don't have to agree with everyone, but you have to respect everyone. So everyone that comes into my courtroom, which I won't have a courtroom anymore. Now as a justice, I will be on the bench and it's a little different. Um, but everyone that comes into our court needs to be treated with respect. You can't hear somebody if you don't respect and value an individual. So my judicial philosophy is access to our courts means 30 access seconds. to all, and all need to be treated equally. Thank you. Uh, Jeff? Yes, so um, as you know, um, the Supreme Court oversees the Washington State Bar Association and the legal community as a whole. And full disclosure, I'm, I'm an attorney, so I'm a member of the bar. Um, but I'm wondering what, where you see the Bar Association going and if there's um, uh, how you see the relationship with the Supreme Court over the coming years. Well, the Bar and the Supreme Court work almost hand in hand. It's my understanding we oversee the Bar Association, and presently we have a number of issues of the Bar Association before us, which I, of course, cannot comment on. So in regards to your question, I think it's, it's a collaborative effort. I think in overseeing the Bar Association, we need to remember we are members of the Bar Association as well, and not forget where we came from. A judge and judicial officer, that, those are titles, but all 30 of us seconds. are attorneys. Thank you. Uh, further questions? Uh, Jason. Yes, uh, Judge Weiner. Um, being a, a person uh, born with developmental disability, uh, fitting hmm. both the uh, federal definition and the state of Washington uh, definition, um, where do you see our judicial system um, handling uh, people who are, uh, uh, has not had a, a voice in the court system uh, as much as others? Well, you have a voice in me. I'm a disabled individual. I have a back condition. And I see things through an accommodationized lens. And a lot of issues, I think, could be resolved if judges and litigants view some of these issues through an accommodation lens. Um, it is difficult maneuvering through an able-bodied world, especially when you visually do not appear to be disabled. 30 seconds. I am. So I, I would differ with you in that. I think you do have a voice and you have a voice at the table. Thank you. Uh, further questions? Um, oh, Clayton, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, Judge Whitener, you, you mentioned uh, Thurgood Marshall, yeah. who I think um, was a giant um, in our culture. Right. Um, I've been thinking, um, since you mentioned him, about uh, Brown v. Board of Education. Uh, which um, in my lifetime, which is now long, um, is a Brown v. Board um, is one of the transcendently important vital decisions of this country. 
of the Supreme Court of this country. And yet now we have reached a point at which that, that uh, the enforcement of that decision has um, essentially um, ground to a halt. Mm -hmm. we, we have massive segregation in schools now. How do, how do, I, how do we think about that? How do we think about the non-enforcement of a vital uh, Supreme Court decision? In regards to Brown versus Board of Education, I agree with everything you said. Brown versus Board of Education was a case that dealt with equality. The courts need to move now beyond that to equity. Equality deals with sameness. And the flaw in that is that many of us did not start at the same place. We have to overcome institutional barriers, structural barriers, 30 seconds. types of barriers. So Brown is the foundation, and I think equity is the future. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Jason. Um, could you speak a little bit about your TED talk? Okay, in 2016, I was asked to do a, um, a TED Talk in um, Port of Spain, Trinidad, and I decided to speak on the different marginalized parts of me. So I spoke on being Black, being a woman, being LGBT, which was illegal at that time, and has since that law has since been found to be unconstitutional. Um, there was work done after my visit that actually preceded the TED Talk, and that um, came about by a proclamation President Obama. 30 seconds. Had, where I was invited to return to Trinidad to speak on human rights. Great, thank you. Any further questions? Oh, yes, Clayton, go ahead. Yes. Um, and Judge Whitener, I've been a fan of uh, of a uh, former citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, V.S. Naipaul. Oh, yes, uh, the writer. For, for a long, long time. And I thought, um, I thought just, for, uh, just for fun, I should ask you um, what you think about the vision of justice that, that comes across in his writings. My goodness, I have not read V.S. Maple since I was in high school. But I would tend to think that um, we all it's make part mistakes. and parcel of who I am. I have not lost my foundation, as you probably have figured out. And it has helped molded my lens in regards to how I see people. But um, to the extent of doing an analysis between where I'm at now and what I learned then, um, I would say that you would have to look at my track record. I have moved far from my roots. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more, if anybody has one. Checking here. Um, one more. Go ahead, Clarice. If I may. Sure. Uh, apropos the, my question about Brown v. Board of Education, um, I am not an attorney. So my, forgive me if my questions are a little ignorant. But no, not at all. Um, <clears throat> in Brown v. Board, uh, Brown v. Board was a, was a question about about the meaning of equality in as institutions are structured. Um, it was not, at, at least as formulated, a question about the related inequities which structured the decisions that were made 
uh, in structuring institutions up to that point. In other words, redlining um, was not part of the consideration of that case. Mm -hmm. What about that? Well, that's what I was trying to say. Many things in regards to Board of Education, you have to see that case as a foundation to where we are now. It dealt with equality. The flaw in that is we're not all equal. We need to be dealing with equity, which is trying to find a fair assessment and meeting people where they're at. If you're dealing with equity, for example, the disability question, then you have to adjust your lens and your thinking to accommodate someone that is outside of the box of Board B, Board of Education. It was a foundational uh, decision, profound decision, but it was flawed in that it made the assessment that we all started from the same place and we did not, and we do not, which is why today we need to look at the impact our actions are having on individuals who did not benefit from a lot of these um, structural systems that were in place. Board of Education is foundational, it's profound, but it is, was just that foundational. And for many years, it kept being the prototype being used. It is foundational. We need to be moving forward and building on that is where I'm at. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we are close to out of time. Would you like to go ahead with a one minute wrap up? I thank all of you for meeting with me this, this evening. I enjoyed the questions and as you probably can figure out, I love talking about the law, I love talking about social issues because it's, that's what we're about. It's about real people, real people's lives that the court is dealing with. And you need individuals on the bench that can relate. Does it mean to say you'll get the decision that you want? No, but what it means is you have a very good fair hearing from the individual that is making that decision that impacts your lives. And I hope I can get your endorsement because that's what I do. Thank you.